Good evening. As president of the College of Coastal Georgia, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to our campus and for this second installment of our distinguished speaker series. I'm so happy to welcome you back to campus if you were able to come to an earlier event, the first of the series that we held in 2019, that featured Atlanta Beltline visionary Ryan Gravel. Um, I was speaking with one of our guests tonight who had not been on this campus since 1974, and we're so glad you're back, and, and some of you might have been a while, and we're just glad to have you back. We're grateful for your presence and for your interest in this topic. As the only four-year institution in this area, we see the college as an important partner in the well-being and development of Brunswick and the Golden Isles. So at Coastal Georgia, we're driven by a commitment to student success. So each day, we work to bring new academic programs and opportunities, additional resources to support our student success, and a more vibrant college community. And we don't do that in a vacuum. We know that our students, our employees, and our community at large are all better if we work together. Undoubtedly, our most precious contribution to the community is the talented, well-educated men and women who graduate from the college each year. Each year, more and more of our students, when they graduate, stay in the community, and they invest their time, their talents, and their treasures in, life, in their life in the Brunswick and Golden Isles area. When you look at our graduating class from May and December of 2018, of those graduates who went into the workforce, who didn't go into a graduate school program, 77% of those students accepted a position in coastal Georgia, with 48% of those students going into the workforce staying in Brunswick. Keep in mind that we have students choosing this college from 35 states 20 countries, and over 100 Georgia counties. So we are a magnet for talent. Another way that the college contributes to this community is by hosting important conversations such as the one will be happening here tonight. This series is only accomplished through the dedication and the hard work, including conceiving the program ideas, securing speakers, promoting the events, delivering the programs, all of this led by the college's foundation board. So I would ask these individuals to please stand and be appreciated by all of us. Please join me in thanking Wayne Johnson, our chair of the College of Coastal Georgia Foundation, Marita Magnus, the chair of the Events and Outreach Committee, Bert Roten and Darren Peach, members of the Distinguished Speaker Series Subcommittee, and then all other members of our foundation board in attendance tonight. Please stand. I'd like to thank the communities of Coastal Georgia Foundation President and CEO Paul White and Communications Director Anna Hall for their support in tonight's event as well. Finally, I want, yes. yes. Finally, I want to recognize a special guest. I'm not sure if he slipped in yet. It may be a little bit later, but the new president and CEO of the Brunswick Golden Isles Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Ralph Staffens. Ralph, have you been able to step in yet? You may be able to see him later as we're, as we're leaving, but I um, wanted to welcome him to our community. So thank you all again for coming tonight. I hope to see you back on campus very soon. And now I would like to invite Foundation Trustee Darren Peach to the stage to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. So before we, uh, we get started, uh, I, I think that it's important that uh, as a former, uh, well, and someone who served in the United States Coast Guard, and I know there are many uh, servicemen and women in this room tonight, and people that appreciate it, but uh, uh, today is the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and uh, coincidentally, uh, considering our speaker tonight, it was uh, basically, uh, for those of you that uh, want to remember this was the American and British led invasion of German occupied France. Uh, many servicemen gave their lives. Many others were fortunate enough to return 
Uh, but obviously, uh, I think it's appropriate that we would give just a moment of silence to think about uh, uh, what that day meant for all of us. So it's hard to believe that uh, we're already into June. And this, uh, as Dr. Johnston pointed out, is the second of our series. Uh, the first one held in March, and uh, that was really a great success. And I really uh, think that we've already seen what, uh, what a few people getting, getting together can do. And we've had uh, just a, a, a tide of momentum in this area, thanks to the start uh, with that program and with many other good things that are going on. But so, with that, we want to we want to continue to build that momentum. We want to get we want to fill this room whenever we have an event. We want people to talk about the progress we're making and all the potential and all the things that we need to be thinking about. So, really excited about that. But tonight, um, we uh, we're going to get to see the second uh, event, and I just want to highlight what these events are meant to be. So first of all, when we think about uh, this program, the Distinguished Speakers Program, the purpose is to bring people together uh, and, and so that we can learn about interesting topics. But this year's theme was really focused on the area. Uh, we, we see the great potential, we see all the good things going on, but we also are frustrated sometimes by lack of progress. So we wanted to bring as many people together and we just felt that the college is a perfect forum for that. And the college has, a, you know, obviously is very interested in this community continuing to strengthen, but also can have a huge impact. So thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> With that, uh, our event tonight is basically uh, going to be composed of two parts. The first is a presentation uh, by Martin O'Hara. And Martin uh, is originally from Britain and actually spends about half of his a year in Britain and the other half here. Uh, he has a very in interesting background um, as a basically a chartered surveyor, which is something that uh, I think he might tell you a little bit more about and what that means, but uh, uh, it, it's important to understand that in, in, in his experience. But he spent about uh, the last 20 years of his life working uh, with port cities and helping to, uh, to bring port cities back uh, from, from a state that they're not content with in the United Kingdom. And so while, uh, while he's uh, going to give us some, some detail on that, I think we can learn a lot and it'll be very interesting. So he'll give a presentation and then uh, our trustee, Bert Roden, will, uh, will then uh, ask him some questions. So uh, you should all have cards or be receiving cards, and, and the sooner you get started writing your questions, the better. Um, but I think that uh, uh, it'll be a, a very interesting opportunity to, to raise questions. And, uh, and you might want to just capture those questions on your own uh, little note card separately so that you have those and you can remember those questions in case they aren't answered tonight so that we can uh, we can make sure that we follow up on those as well. Uh, so with that, I would like Martin to come up and uh, we'll introduce him in person. We're very excited to have him here tonight. Uh, he actually is uh, a resident of the Golden Isles and he's, uh, he's had a, a residence here for about 10 years now. So with that, welcome. Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for asking me to give the talk. Uh, Michelle and her team to give the talk. Uh, thank you to Paul White from the um, Community Foundation for Coastal Georgia, who's involved me in discussions in the last couple of months, which I've really enjoyed and found very positive. And thank you to you for coming. I didn't know I had that many friends. Uh, but no, thank you for coming because it shows you care. And people who care are really important to making things happen. So, um, Dan's introduced me. I've got a degree in building surveying. Building surveying is something I don't think you have in America. It's not looking through, through three odd lights down roads. It's basically uh, understanding how buildings are put together and how possibly you can repurpose them in the future. 
I'm a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. Uh, that's the um, professional institute to which all surveyors belong. And importantly, um, I'm, a, I'm a regional assessor for their awards scheme. I've been an awards assessor for over 25 years. Um, I worked out I've probably seen between 200 and 250 different schemes, of which about half are about revitalization, regeneration, community benefit. And that comes back into things I'll talk about later. My connection to the Golden Isles, very quickly, been here, been visiting for 20 years, owned a home for 11, I retired non-resident, um, I stay for six months a year in three visits. Um, I depart on Saturday, so if this doesn't go well, I've got a quick getaway. <laughs> but uh, my working life, I spent three years working for a firm of architects, the next 11 years working in retail investment or development, and then the final 21 years of my working life until I finished in 2015 for Associated British Ports in Port Operations and Regeneration. Uh, ABP are the UK's largest port group. They own 21 ports around the UK and handle about a quarter of the imports and exports. Um, of the ports on the map across there, in case you're not used to uh, Britain, Ipswich is there. London is there. You're about an hour out. Uh, the area over here is East Anglia. The northern part is called Norfolk. The southern part is called Suffolk. Uh, I dealt with uh, property matters in 12 of the ports of which six I was involved in revitalization, and then I worked on two other ports uh, peripherally. But of those ports, um, Ipswich stands out to me as the one that's most, um, has most comparison to, to uh, Brunswick. Um, moving this on. But my role for ABP was to work with operational colleagues. My principal role was to manage the assets and build new facilities. So I was trying to get new business for the ports and building shed silos for them. But an important part of my role was to identify land that was surplus to their operational requirements, try to identify uh, alternative uses to it, and then work with local government and agencies to deliver regeneration and development. That I have a number of provisos. Uh, when I first made this slide, I said I'd not spoken to any landowners or any local government bodies, but then the last two months I've got more involved locally, so now I've not spoken in any depth to <laughs> US landowners or local government bodies. I got limited, so no knowledge of US zoning, taxes, funding aid, and I don't claim to be perfect. Uh, we made mistakes, I made mistakes, there are things I would change. In the last few weeks, I've not recognized my own publicity. I don't consider myself to be distinguished, I'm certainly not an expert, I'm not an authority. What I am is somebody with a fair degree of experience, uh, over 20 odd years, and I've been exposed to an awful lot of schemes through the RSS Awards Scheme. I don't want to tell you things you already know, but I probably will. And I don't want to tell you what you should do in Brunswick, but again, I probably will. <laughs> but to, to give some idea of the comparisons between Ipswich and Brunswick, uh, the town of Ipswich radiates, and its administrative body, radiates about three miles out from its centre, as does, roughly speaking, the city of Brunswick. It's a deprived area. About 30% uh, of its children live in poverty. It's surrounded by a rural hinterland. Its county is Suffolk. It's the county town of Suffolk. That is, oh sorry, I missed out to say, it's for a council is, has got poverty, but also it's controlled by a Labour controlled uh, local government. Suffolk is a rural hinterland that is conservative, so there are tensions between the two. About half an hour, 45 minutes away from Ipswich are two very expensive and very nice coastal resorts called Oldborough and Southwold, sort of London on sea. Uh, in Southwold, you can buy a beach shop, and the beach shop's a timber shed about 8 foot by 10 foot for around about $150,000. And it's about an hour from London, as you're about an hour away from Savannah or Jacksonville. Both cities struggled with what, their D what was their DNA. Ryan said the same thing. You have to work out who you were, who you are, and what you want to be. Because every, every town, every city is different. Recently I read in the paper, um, it talked about the trip I and others went on up to Macon. And it said that we were looking to mimic Macon. We weren't looking to mimic Macon. 
Every place is different. You learn lessons by going to Macon. You may learn lessons by listening to me. But, if, but Brunswick needs Brunswick's solution. Take lessons, but it's your own solution. Both Ipswich and uh, Brunswick have got an isolated and underutilised waterfront. In our case, it's because we have four lanes of very heavy traffic. In your case, it's because you've got 100 odd feet of empty tarmac, Bay Street. And both have got quality components. I put quality components down rather than good bones. I know Ben Slade's in the audience, when he told me he was sick of hearing good bones. <laughs> and uh, quality components, basically in Ipswich, we had 13 medieval churches, some wonderful old buildings going back to the medieval times. Uh, but they got lost amongst 1970s mediocrity. Uh, they've not been, been highlighted at all. In Brunswick, you've got squares, you've got the buildings, to me, very similar. And both have got opportunity and potential. So what do I intend to do? I intend to focus on Ipswich, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, principally I'm here to talk about Ipswich. But uh, I will explain what we did, I'll suggest there are similarities, and hopefully I will provoke thought. I'm not here to teach people lessons. I, I've read again the lessons you can learn. I'm not giving you a lecture, I'm giving you a talk. There are people in Brunswick, good people in Brunswick, who know exactly what they need to do, are set on the check train of doing it. But if I can give some momentum to what they're doing, so much the better. So, the Port of Ipswich, it was the first crossing point on the River Orwell. Uh, I think it was Roman times, but certainly it was Anglo-Saxon times, and it was a trust port. A trust port is a port that's owned by the local authority and administered by a body, of a combined body of local authority members and um, commercial business um, members. It grew really well through the 20s and 30s, largely focused on agribooks, which is grains, fertilizers, animals, foodstuffs. In the 70s, it expanded into row, 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 roll on, roll off traffic, similar to what you have over in Brunswick. And in 1994, it was the fifth largest row, row port in, in the UK. Unfortunately, in 1995, it lost all four of its customers. Because it was a public-owned body, it didn't have the resources to react as possibly the private sector might. And so John Major, in 1996, decided to privatise it. Uh, in the bid brochure, I was in the bid team, and in the bid brochure, it said that money would not be the only consideration. You know, I bet they all say that. <laughs> and um, in fairness to them, it wasn't. But um, we went to look at about 200 acres of port land, which was run down. The workforce was demoralized. It had reduced in number massively. And the local community, even though they, were, it, it wasn't, they weren't working on the port, they were looking for port revitalization and employment. Uh, there were 17 people who expressed interest in bidding for the port. There were four bids that were actually submitted. And we were the third highest of those four bids. The first highest basic wanted to break up the port and set off for housing, for land. The second and third were very similar in terms of the actual bid. Uh, the second one was Hutchinson Wampoa, who owned the port of Felixstowe, a big, um, a big um, container terminal. And they wanted to use it, which is an offshoot, uh, in effect. But we wanted to refocus on the agribook sector. It's which is 10 miles down a river in an agricultural heartland. It, it had forgotten, the port had forgotten what it, what, it, what it should be. But we also believe there was an opportunity for regeneration. So on the map, that's the old part of the port, what we call now it's its waterfront. Um, the river used to run straight through in the 1830s, I think it was, they put a lock across and drove through a canal, so you had an enclosed body of water. Um, the second phase of it would have been down here, which was the east bank, this was where the agribooks was, and this area here was where the row road terminal was, all reclaimed land. So we inherited that 80 odd acres pretty much vacant. That was constrained by a lock, and as vessels get bigger, less and less could get through the lock. And we had sheds that were falling down over here, that the, they, they were part of the food chain, and the food standards were forever rising, and even though at the time they were just about okay, they were not going to be good for long. So that's a picture of Ipswich in about the time we bought it, 1997. The town centre, the high street, the Newcastle street of Ipswich is about there, and that's probably about a quarter of a mile, half a mile, down to the waterfront. Our offices were down there. Train station over here, 
And as you drove in from this way, dereliction of warehouse, builder's warehouse, grain silos, containers, timber over there. The process. When we bought the fort in March, we said that we were going to try and get revitalization of the waterfront underway. So in probably June, we met up, we being myself and the port manager, met up with the leaders of Ipswich Borough Council and EDA, the East of England Development Agency, the government funding body that could possibly put money into Ipswich. And we talked about how we might get this started. Had ADP called the meeting, everybody would have thought that was us trying to make money, that was our job to make money. If the local authority had called the meeting, it probably would have been poo-pooed because, well, they've had lots of meetings before and lots of plans before, but nothing's ever happened. But because EDA called the meeting, who basically had a pot of money that possibly we might be able to access, they were the honest broker. They were the people without skin in the, direct skin in the game. And they called together a group of stakeholders, which was basically themselves, Ipswich Borough Council, Suffolk County Council, four or five major landholders, um, the college, which I'll come to later, and um, at that time we had no residential population around the waterfront, so we called in the Ipswich Society uh, to represent the people. Um, we decided very early on that there had to be an independent chair, and the first chair was the MD of a brewery, the second one was the chairman of the Ipswich Society, and now, I believe, uh, it's the former editor of their local newspaper. <coughs> but it was somebody who people trusted. When we met, we met in privacy, with privacy. It wasn't secret, but we sat in a room and we played by what you call Chatham House rules. What's said in the room stays in the room. So what happens over a period of time is you build trust. Because the first time you sit in that room, you don't trust the soul. Uh, that's how it's been in Ipswich for 20 years. But the second time you go in that room, you hear people talk, you think, well, I may not agree with everything he says, but actually he seems like a reasonable guy. And by the third time, well, actually, maybe I do agree with some of what he says. And with time and privacy, not, not taking lumps out of each other, you go to close trust. It'll come in later, but um, two of the members we had were the, lead, the Labour leader of the um, Ipswich, Ipswich Borough Council and the Conservative MP for Ipswich. They stood against each other in our, in our general election. In public, they knocked lumps out of each other, but in private, they actually agreed mostly on what they wanted to achieve and how they wanted to achieve it. Both of them cared. What we decided we were going to try and be was policy influencing, not decision making. Um, we, we had fairly influential people around the table and we were able to talk to the right people to remove the logs that have been placed in the way, sometimes unnecessarily. We tried to work towards consensus, common goals. We all put money into a fund to jointly appoint consultants. These won't be the right numbers, but to give you an idea, everybody pitched in, but EDA will have put $20,000, ADP will have put $2,000, and the Egypt Society will have put $200. Didn't matter what the numbers were, what was important was that we all pitched in. We all literally bought into these consultants coming around who carried out some private interviews with us to assess what we all wanted out of this. And some people wanted to sell off and go, some people wanted to expand. Different people had different dreams, but when they gave us a report back, which is the most important thing I'll say, about 75% of what we wanted, we all wanted. And about 25% of it we disagreed on, and probably about 10% of that we still disagree on. But we decided to work towards common goals, to put the differences aside, and to achieve 75%. The key, we decided to identify key areas for, pro, key areas for progress in about a five year time frame. We had a big discussion about whether either came and did one big thing that we hoped would then spread out around, or whether we go for a cluster effect of four or five schemes with smaller sums of money but each together made a bigger difference. We had to acknowledge these difficulties and be pragmatic about getting around. You, you, you know, your place is not perfect. It doesn't always work as you want it to do. It certainly doesn't work in the order you want it to. We have priorities that, that got shuffled all the time. And compromise is not a failure. 
That's what I meant with Brexit going on at present, I'm not the one to talk. But, but, but compromise is not a failure. That's what adults do. To achieve things sometimes, you just have to compromise. You get the best of what you can. We agreed priorities and we agreed to take achievable early steps because that gave the, the people of Ipswich credibility and confidence that we would deliver more. It's about delivery, not dreams. And so this is a statement that Ben Gummer, the Conservative MP for Ipswich, made, which is that it's better to achieve the good than hold out for perfection and end up with nothing. And that's really, really true. There's a temptation, that's not saying to accept second best, but there's a temptation sometimes to go for perfect when really you need to get a ball rolling and keep it rolling. So I'm now going to talk about people and consultation. Successful regeneration is about more than just buildings and funding. It's about people and pride. And in fact, on the trip to Macon, I said those final words. It's about people and pride. And somebody else said to me later, it's about another P. It's about people, pride, and passion. Because you can be people and proud, but you need passion to make things happen. You need people to get behind what you want to achieve. So, I could have headed this just consultation, but I put people in consultation because I want you to remember people the whole way through. So you've got the residents. Uh, I believe you have to talk to the residents early. It has to be real. You have to ask them what they want and then really listen to the answer. Because what you, the business community, think is best for them may not be what bothers them. And if you can solve or address one or two of their problems, you'd be amazed how they get behind your issues. The difficulty is sometimes engaging with that demographic. Um, there's a certain demographic, you'll all be able to do it on the internet or whether you do it by paper, you'll always get their responses. But the unmarried mother, the hardworking family, unemployed, are much harder to get to. And so you have to go to them. Don't call a meeting at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday in Brunswick Library. Go on a Sunday afternoon to one of their schools in their community. And so the top picture there is us at a school getting information back, and that's another presentation we did below. Because you're trying to get their buy-in and support. People can make things happen. Politicians are voted in, oops, let's go back. Politicians are voted in by people. So people matter to politicians. And that's the line that every residence group everywhere in the world will tell you. Plan with us, not for us. An easier group to talk to the business community. Um, by that I mean commercial, offices, retail, leisure. But I also mean industry. Uh, they may not be within the area you're trying to regenerate, but they may have an impact on it. They certainly will be a big employer locally. You can talk to representative bodies, such as the Chamber. And you'll also speak to an awful lot of entrepreneurs and risk take takers. And sometimes they're not the easiest to deal with. They used to get their own way. Yeah, they, they take a risk and they get their own way. But you have to listen to them because they take chances and, and sometimes you have to support those chances because they've got more than just heart invested. They've got dollars invested or pounds invested. We were also lucky because we had a college in Ipswich. Um, Ipswich College was situated about three miles outside of Ipswich, uh, but it aspired to be a university. And over time, it became first the university campus of Suffolk where it had its degrees given to it by University of East Anglia and University of Essex. And then probably about three years ago, they're now uh, a university in their own right, it's called the University of Suffolk. Um, their motivation, to, they wanted to be down on the waterfront because they felt it would give them a promotional edge in a competitive educational market. It could make them different from other universities. Uh, and so every photograph you see on their website or any of their brochures will always be of the, the university campus down on the waterfront. Their facilities can be shared and they can be a, an attraction to other people outside of the university. They can be a catalyst for other things. So, for example, the university in Southampton uh, had a, had a um, theatre on site and they had a, 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 a um, gallery of pictures uh, given to them by John Hansard that two men and a dog used to look at. And they went down into Southampton Town Centre, into what they call the cultural quarter there, and the gallery that used to have two men and a dog got 27,000 visitors in its first three months. 
uh, education can sometimes access alternative funding streams that investors or local authorities can't access. And we use that particularly for safe routes to the university, uh, from the station to the university. Uh, we put money, other people put money in. We got money from SUSTRANS, which was a cycle, uh, sustainable transport cycle lane. And the university were able to access money for making sure their students were safe to and from the station. As Michelle, oh sorry, students tend to spend rather than, than save. They um, will support cafes, bars, restaurants. They give life to a place. And as Michelle said, students often settle where they study. We, like Brunswick, had a vibrant artistic community. The artistic community are often pioneering. They're, they're great for taking early, low-cost opportunities. And I know in Brunswick you've got a mural scheme, and I wish it had to success. But there's other options that you could look at for the younger demographic. Um, in Brighton, they set up a cent uh, an area of town where they suffered with graffiti. And a builder put a building hoarding around, and it was graffitied. But the thing is, the local population and the local police knew who was doing the, doing the uh, graffiti. They just couldn't catch them doing it. And so the developer got to two of the guys who was involved in doing graffiti, urban art is another word for it, and um, said, look, once a month, we'll give you the hoarding, we'll paint it grey, you organise your kids, come down here, do their stuff on it. And, they did, and we give them paint, and they did. And it became the place for the kids to go to show their mates where they did their artwork. And it was a real shame because some of the artwork that was really good, but every, sorry, every month it got repainted grey. But some of the kids would have liked to have kept their, their artwork. And so the builder stopped using eight by four sheets of ply and started using four by four sheets of ply so the kids could take home his four by four sheet and put it on his bedroom wall. And then people started buying the four by four sheets of ply and that paid for more paint to do more spraying or painting. So it's a real idea for a different demographic. Murals are there for the long term. Murals are, are there for 20, 50 years by artists, by older people maybe. Um, next one, want an act of brandalism. Uh, go to Strothers in, South, in, in St. Simons. Go to Coca-Cola almost anywhere. And they were painting on buildings, uh, brandalism. We were looking at Ipswich because we had a vibrant theatre. We had about like five or six theatres, two professional theatres and certainly a number of semi-professional ones. We had a good music scene, but we also had a regional dance group who wanted a home called Dance East, and they were fundamental to what we later achieved. So our vision was to become East Anglia's premier water waterfront town and creative capital. We wanted to link mixed-use residential, education, business incubation, arts and culture, leisure, food, and not forgetting our maritime heritage. Are you familiar with business incubation? Does it mean anything to people? Right, business incubation is you have lots and lots of people who have very good ideas, and they do them from their kitchen table, and they want to do it from somewhere better. And so we provided business space, something like the WIC, but maybe not quite so formal, where you could rent on a very short-term basis, maybe for a month, a desk or a room or a couple of rooms, and some of these businesses grew exponentially. Uh, we, we're located about an hour and a half from Cambridge. We're about 45 minutes from a place called Marshallsham where BT are raised. We've got a lot of in intellect with loads of ideas. And some of these businesses went from one to 10 in a year. Some of them went from one to 100 in five years. So that's the master plan that we drew up in 1997. I put it up only because about half of that we achieved. Most things change. You have plans, they change. The area of the waterfront was about 150 acres. We focused on the northern keys, the bit nearest the town. Of those things there, uh, we wanted to put a bridge across here. We didn't do that. We wanted to infill the dock there. We didn't do that. We wanted to take out a lane of traffic there so that you only had to cross the one road. We didn't do that. But many of the things on there we did do. We did get the art centre down here. We did create a focus point around the old custom house. We did bring residential and the university down and over there. So, these are pictures now of Ipswich. Um, it's important, whether you're Macon, Brunswick, or Ipswich, to make it unique. Create a sense of place. And we decided to focus on several things, but the two on this slide are waterfront dining 
and, enlarge, and maritime heritage, enlarging the marinas. So that's a brand new, uh, new restaurant, high-end restaurant that has been built next to some new residential accommodation. That is a 15th to 17th century Maltings building with a complex behind it, the Isaac Lord complex. It's now, um, that's a pub. Next to it here now is a restaurant been built. At the back you've got a wedding venue, you've got accommodation. That was a warehouse that's now a five-star hotel, urban boutique hotel, put a roof on, put a new floor on top and then built a new extension to it there. That's the Bellway uh, development of residential homes. That's inside a floating restaurant that's permanently moored against the quay. And we've now got three different um, operations who sail down the River Orwell. Um, the River Orwell is a triple SI, Ramsar site, you name it, it's got the designation. And uh, that is a Thames barge, which we allow to moor up on the common quay for free. Uh, they take trips down the Orwell and back. We have a, another one that uh, goes out uh, probably for an hour, a shorter period of time, which is just a regular boat, and then we have a dinner cruise that takes you out so you can eat meals in the evening. We decided to try and showcase some of the hidden gems that have been lost in its switch around the waterfront and to encourage vernacular design, make it look like it belongs in the place. Um, so that, I'll show you later photograph, was a warehouse and office. It's now a bistro. This was largely derelict at the back of the Isaac Lord building. It's now Airbnb accommodation. And that's the customs house, which was our offices. The top floor is, is offices. The lower ground floor is a maritime museum and a conference center, meeting rooms. Um, we lit it as part of the process, and it stands out a lot more now. But just up the way from us is a place called Aldborough. Uh, that's the line of people waiting to buy fish and chips in Aldborough. Uh, Aldborough sells itself on its fish and chips. This is the company shed in Mersey Island. Mersey Island is known for its oysters. You're right next to the fishermen when they come in, and you go and sit family style around a big table. It's a bring your own bottle establishment, and you can't make reservations. It's full all the time. You can do that in Brunswick. This is an urban location, but back to the murals. Peckham is located between the um, Clerkenwell School of Art and the Central St. Martin's School of Art, so it's quite an arty area. Um, some big name artists, um, Tracy Emin, Damon Hurst, um, have all been in those, uh, those colleges. And they went for murals, they went for prominent murals on very prominent corners. That's I Love Peckham, it's in there, you might be able to see it. That's a Belgian artist. Um, called Roa, R-O-A, um, that's on the wall of a pub. And those bollards down there were designed by Anthony Gorman, who's one of our foremost sculptors, who did the Angel of the North, you know, who knows it up in Newcastle. And they're just better than a plain old bollard. Uh, they specially designed light lamp standards, and uh, probably cost a fortune, but do make a difference. And that place is buzzing at night. To make things work, you have to connect them together. You have to improve the public linkage. For us, we had a vehicle-dominated environment. It was unfriendly, unappealing to pedestrians, and so we had to make better pedestrian and cycle routes around the town, to, from the town centre down to the waterfront. And we went for a thing called park and walk. Uh, we created car parks, sorry, we created car parks maybe half a mile out of the main centre. Uh, to encourage people to walk into town because you don't get many people spending money as they drive at 30 miles an hour past your door. Uh, they will stop and shop or drink or eat if they're walking. So the routes need to be safe, they need to be paved, they need to be lit. Down here they need to have canopy for shade, be it trees or canopies. And in instance we had a historic trail around the town centre, uh, but we made a waterfront trail to make it into a figure of eight, which is almost the perfect because then you can walk two circles or one figure of eight. And, um, and that definitely improved the linkage between the town centre and the waterfront. The high street in Ipswich was going under, it was undergoing, uh, well, evolution is kind. It was under threat. In the 1970s, the UK had created clone centres with no soul or character. Every high street looked the same. I guess it's probably the same in the US. Uh, out-of-town retailing and then internet shopping 
have both dealt with the high street um, danger, fatal, if not fatal, strong blows. And people now are concerned about how they spend their time and how they spend the money. They're looking to shift from buying more and more consumer goods to experiences. They like to discover things. And so be careful when you plan things. Allow organic growth, because the best places aren't designed, they evolve, which really kills me when I've spent 40 years of my life trying to design places. <laughs> but it's the truth, is that everybody likes to discover places. Everybody likes things that grow organically. And I would encourage you to look at mixed-use development. Investors love standalone silos. They love a commercial offices, commercial retail, residential investment in silos. But they'll buy, and they will work, horizontal integration through mixed-use. When you look at your town centre, focus on things you want to do, such as culture, leisure, and food, and focus on things you need to do, education, library, healthcare, local government, court. They're the basics that people will still go into town centres for. They may go into retail because it's a leisure activity now, but, but it, the, the town centres can't be what they were. They, ha they have to reconsider themselves. So for us, we try to make it unique and create a sense of place to improve connectivity, to encourage mixed use and bring people back into the centre, consolidating viable retail and then reutilising re some derelict sites for alternative uses. In Ipswich, one of the department stores um, closed down. It sat there as a blight for a number of years. They're now building a primary school on site in the town centre and provide an offer that the public either want or need. So what we achieve in Ipswich, that's a nice picture of Ipswich in probably the 1700s, I guess, when the river was there in the other. But that's more recent, it's about 1970. And those are all grain silos. And so that gave us, broadly speaking, the skyline we now have. Eight, 10, 12 storey high grain silos. Um, but we've gone back high. Not everywhere, but in certain locations. But, uh, that's 1970 again. That you'll see that building later, it's got a new glass, that all came down, a new glass front on it, all this has all come down. And that's the building I showed you where the, um, the bistro is. Um, the bistro is now, and the floating restaurant is located there. We integrated existing initiatives. There were things already happening in Ipswich, as there are in Brunswick. So in March 98, soon after we bought the port, Cardinal Park opened. It was a gateway site as you drove into town. And they put an 11th Street multiplex in there. In England, we call them Section 106 or Community Infrastructure Lake Levy. Here you call it impact fees. But almost everything in, in, um, in England will have a Community Infrastructure Levy or a, a 106 agreement with it. Because they all put a load on the infrastructure. They all put a load on the community. And we used the money from that to improve St. Peter Street, which is one of the main links from the town centre down to the waterfront. We started off fairly early. Uh, Ida, and us, well, Ida put money in. We helped with some of the pavings. And a very brave developer took a building which was called Philor Maltings. Maltings are where you store grains for the brewing process. And they started work on that. They've now created 110,000 square feet of offices. Because of our meetings in private, probably, uh, the top two floors, I think, were taken by Suffolk County Council. Another floor was taken by non-profits. Another floor was taken by firm solicitors. And the ground floor, about 20,000 square feet, was used for incubation space, for start-up businesses. In December, <coughs> Fairway Homes started developing Neptune Square houses here. It's a block of, it's four blocks in total, 69 homes. Originally they were intending to build them in four phases, possibly in two phases, but because of our private conversations, they were aware that Associated British Courts, the company I worked for, were going to change the steel lock gates a year later and intended to build a, a marina. And on their opening day, uh, they had show homes available they had something like 200 people. There was no houses down the waterfront. They had 200 people turn up to have a look. The first 20 homes they released were sold that day. And that proved there was a market for, re for residential down in the waterfront. And you'll see later how many new homes were built. 
So that's since which in 1999, the 50 birth marina is now getting a bit bigger. That's field maltings now restored. That's a kitchen warehouse that I'll come back to later. That's the Bellway Flats over there. But this is all still pretty industrial. Timber down here, grains over here, asphalt coating plant is there. And so one of my jobs was managing the interface between heavy, heavy business and these new things that were happening. But you can do it. So in 2000, ABP installed new steel lock gates. The old lock gates were timber and could only open one, uh, two hours either side of the tide. The new steel lock gates could open 24-7. And on the back of that, we developed a new marina of 450 berths. The previous marina that was there went from 50 to 150 berths. We attracted Fairline boats, which you may not have heard of, but the likes of Sun Seekers. They're very expensive, very nice pieces of white plastic. And um, if you're buying a two million pound piece of white plastic, you want it to work. And so what happens with this, they, they make them elsewhere, bring them down to uh, Ipswich, and then they take them out and PDI them, pre-delivery inspection. They take them out and test them and bring them back. And next to that, uh, we built a new facility for Spirit Yachts. Spirit Yachts build about four absolutely stunning timber yachts a year. Uh, they cost more than the power lines do. But both those two things and the marinas add to quality, the, the feeling, the perception of quality. And so when people buy their dream with their rose coloured spectacles in their flat that overlooks the asphalt coating plant, they, they're dreaming about what it might be, no, not about what it is. They're seeing the future. The Northern Keys were fundamentally important to us. That was the bit that we had to get the people of Ipswich down to. And uh, over a period of time, we undertook works down there. When we bought the port, that, that down there was potholes, railway lines, trip hazards, prostitutes. It was not a nice place to be. It was a port. There were signs everywhere saying politely, this is a port, go away. It wasn't quite as polite as that. Ipswich didn't realise it had a waterfront. And so one of the things we did, working with the local authority and others, was to put in a, a, a new pay finish. Personally, I would have liked to have kept some of the railway lines and kept some cobbles but it had to be flat and safe because we were working with the local authority and they were concerned about people falling over and tripping. And so you have to compromise, but it's a damn sight better than it was. And we were fortunate in June 2002, we mentioned the Queen came down and opened it, which gave a big lift to it, which at the time. So in 2002, we've now got, that is restored now from being a kitchen warehouse, a kitchen distribution center into a, another incubation center, IP City about 50,000 square feet. Phenol Maltings is round there, coming down round uh, our Bellway Flats are there. I'll use this now. The college is now on that site there and owns this site there. It's got teaching facilities down here, teaching facilities here, and dorms at the back there. Um, there's housing on this site, there's a car park on that site. There's housing all over that builders, merchants there, is housing all the way down here. So, we have now created over 2,500 new homes in 12 separate developments. Some of them are in restored buildings, some of them are in new build. We've created over 200,000 square feet of new office space, of which probably about 70,000 square feet of which is the incubation for startup businesses. One of the things we hoped at the off was we get more proper offices down on the waterfront. We probably undercut the number of houses we'd get and overcut the number of the amount of office space. But um, we think we did okay. We've got four new hotels creating about 350 bedrooms. It's a mix of grades. Salt House Harbour is a boutique hotel, the no hotel travel, travel lodge of Premier Inn are all sort of run of the mill. We've got one performing arts venue, the Jewish Dance House with 20, 200 seats and then three separate little dance studios. We've got 14 restaurants, we've got 600 marina births, we've got three river cruises, and of the three disused churches that were down on the, in the Waterfront area, uh, two of them have been brought back into use. One for choral works or chamber music, uh, the other one is principally for a historical museum visitor centre. The 
Ipswich College is now the University of Suffolk. Uh, they still have an off, uh, off waterfront uh, campus, but their main teaching facility is located down to the waterfront from 2008. Um, that's their headquarters, that's where the main teaching takes place. It's their photographic, one of the photographs. And then this one is also teaching facilities, Student Union Bar, there's a cafe under that one. And at the back, there's uh, 600 dorms called Athena Hall, built in 2011. I'll show you later why that's called the wine rack, but this is what's going on at present. Um, in the mid 2000s, 2005, 2006, um, a builder went bust, went into liquidation, leaving a skeleton of concrete that 10 storeys high. And it stayed there for probably 10 years, and everybody called it the wine rack. And so a new, a new developer has now bought it and is creating units of accommodation out of it. And he decided to go with the flow. And so he's called it the wine rack. And I think that's very wise. So, so what did we do on the port? Well, we went from being not a basket case, but certainly a port with troubles, into being the UK's biggest export grain port. Uh, we've grown the tonnage handles from 1 million tonnes in 97 to 3 million tonnes now. We've invested in port facilities over 40 million pounds, 50 million dollars, and we've created half a million square feet of new warehousing, principally for the agriculture sector. Trades increased by 50%, employment by 45%. But the main thing that AUP's ownership did is that we were prepared to talk to other people about revitalising the waterfront and regeneration of the waterfront. So, to remind you, that was what it was like then, and that's what it's like now. I'm afraid I'm going to have to read this next slide out because I'll forget it. But what have we done? Spiel Maltings, 110,000 square feet of offices. Key West, 29 residential units. Griffin Wharf, 468 um, residential units. Not so showed there, but just off the picture here is Cardinal Lofts, 198 units. The church, which is just off picture there, uh, is the um, it mentioned in the Doomsday Book, do Doomsday Book and is currently a, a music and arts centre. The, the mill, the performing arts centre, is under that tower block there. These are residential, those are residential. Shops haven't come in down there yet, but they will. Uh, Albion Wharf, mainly residential. The, that's, that's the wine rack in all the glory. <laughs> Uh, that's the Premier Inn, that's the floating restaurant, that's the glass fronted office I'll show you shortly, that's the um, that's more restaurants, that's the hotel, that's Bellway Flats, that's the new marina, that's the University, uh, that's the University of Suffolk, and that's their other teaching facility, and this is the dorms over there, that's a residential block of about 125 units, back over here, is Fairview Homes 372 units on the island. Fairline boats are in there with their expensive white plastic, and uh, Spirit Yachts are in. Where are they? Spirit Yachts are in there, over there. And it's a marina spreads now all the way around the, the corner. So, some pretty pictures of Ipswich to finish. That's the glass fronted office block, firm solicitors in there. That's our offices. These are all residential tower blocks. Wine rack. More pictures of Ipswich. Pictures of Ipswich at night. You have to have a tagline. And our tagline was uh, the key to the future, the key to success. Yours will be different, but you'll have one. Before I finish, I want to tell you a little personal story. One of the first things we did uh, was we put about £150,000 this is about $180,000, into repaving a section of the key edge. And at that time, I was spending probably two or three days a week in Ipswich overnight. Now, I'm not from Ipswich. And one night I was working late, came out of the office at about 7 o'clock, and as I walked down the stairs, a haulier that I knew on the port was walking down with two little kids in his hand. And his name was Paul Key. And I said, oh, Paul, you know, what are you doing down here? Bringing the grandchildren down to feed the swans because we had all the vaulting with lots of grain in the water. Bringing the grandchildren down to feed the swans. Doing a good job down here, Martin. And that's one of the two biggest highlights of my working life because clearly what we were doing was changing people's.
people's perception of the war it was changing people's lives. Regeneration, revitalization can be quite a big deal. So, I mean, promise not to talk about Brunswick, briefly. <laughs> You're just off the I-95 in US-17. That, that means a hell of a lot of people go past your door, you've got to get over them and bring them in. You're starting from a better base than we were in Ipswich. You've got things going on, investments and developments and proposals and plans. We didn't have any of that when we started. You've got the old town district, you've got the squares, you've got the city hall, you've got the, the old buildings, residential buildings that are being, can be regenerated uh, around the, in the square, Hanover Square, around Hanover Square, and, and that's so much potential. Brunswick's an integral part of the Gold Mars. The Gold Mars, Scott McGrain said, was five pieces, and it is. But Sea Island and Little Prince Island is maybe not quite so accessible to many. But for, for St. Simons, Jekyll, and Brunswick, you're part of a triumvirate. People should be coming here for a week's vacation and spending time in all three of those places as part of a, an in, a, a rounded package. Because three million people come down here and put about $1.5 billion into your economy. Brunswick does have the potential to offer something alternative and unique to the Golden Art experience. So if I can leave you with just one thought, it is try and achieve the 75% you agree on, rather than argue about the 25% you don't agree on. Thank you for listening. The written examinations on Ipswich uh, regeneration will be handed out shortly. You'll be graded very harshly. Um, one, one quick personal note. Um, Martin and I have known each other for about 20 years. I, I was uh, assigned briefly to live in uh, London or outside London uh, to cover Europe and Africa because why not? Um, and we met, our families met, our kids are in the same school. So just out of full disclosure, um, I've known Martin a long time. I know about his passion. And actually a lot of you do too. How many people in this room have actually had a direct conversation with Martin at some point? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> well, the, you came anyway. Um, I think that's really good. It speaks volumes. So can I just say, Bert has also been to I have been to Ipswich, and it was driving through Ipswich when I said, he needs to come to Brunswick um, again. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot I would have asked that you decided to answer anyway, but um, the, it, there's no question that for the past couple of months, without it, you've been deeply involved in a lot of discussions about Brunswick, and that your knowledge has advanced beyond where you were uh, when you did this some time ago. What what would you say is the is the single biggest revelation for you over the, over the past few weeks? Revelation. Yes. By the way, we are a country divided by the same language, so if, if we need translation, we'll we'll help one another. I'm going to say maybe not answer your question directly as revelation, but the thing that's impressed me most, which is not quite the same, is that um, Paul White and the Coastal College, the Coastal Foundation, the Community Foundation for Coastal Georgia, invited me to attend some meetings and then got to make it. And I've been absolutely blown away by the enthusiasm of the people who meet there, the diversity of the people who meet there, and the spirit of collaboration amongst them. That they all want to, to make Brunswick better. Brunswick's good, good, but they want to make it better, and they're determined to push this ball down the road. And so I just would say to everybody here, things like the RSVP, RSVP, Wait, that's my problem. You know, there's, a, there's a consultation tomorrow in the Liberty Building on Newcastle, um, where Julie Martin, who I know is here, and, um, and uh, others are um, wanting feedback from the community. Give them feedback. Engage in the process. Show your passion that, that you want it to change and want it to improve. Push the ball down the road. When, um, so, uh, this could be hard, to, hard for you to answer to some degree, but um, aside from the fact that, you know, Melinda and me, why are you here? Why did you decide to buy here? 
What did you see? Uh, beauty. Right. We, we love nature, and we love unspoiled nature, and you have it in abundance. I'm not convinced that everybody appreciates it. A lot of people appreciate it, but they're not appreciated enough. If you go down from North Carolina to well, you're way down from it, this is the best bit of unspoiled you've got. It's so much to love here. And whilst it's not the Rockies, it's not the Grand Canyon, it's beguiling. The word we use is beguiling. It draws you in, and once it's drawn you in, it's got you. And that's why I spend half my life here. And so when you think of Brunswick, and I'm, we are going to talk about Brunswick now, um, when you when you look at Brunswick, or when you look at it early on, through the eye, through your eyes, with what you're seeing and what you understand about yep. communities and communities around ports, what did you see? Honestly, yes. Division. This is not a great thing to do. I probably intend to go there. But I saw well-intentioned people, all who want. Brunswick could be better. All with lo there's, lo there's lots of plans for Brunswick. Right? I looked at the uh, the plan for Mary Ross Park that was prepared in 2015. It refers to 27 other plans. From a guy from outside, that's madness. Right? And every one of those plans is probably uh, you're well prepared, uh, got good points it's making, it's, it's worth some of stuff, lots of effort put into it. But 27 of them? As, as a potential investor, you're lost amongst it. But do I go to the Urban Regeneration Agency or do I go to the Downtown Development Authority? Is it, is it county? Is it city? So, so that, just making it cleaner, easier, not cleaner, but clearer, and to me would make life so much better for, for investors. Um, I saw potential. Everybody who comes down here, probably for the last 20, 30 years, can see the potential of place. So you've got to then start saying, well, why isn't it happening? And that's what I hope now can get addressed. The, 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 try and move some of the logs out of the way. Try and achieve the 75%. But if, if you put all the county commissioners, all the city councillors, all the officers, all the business community in a room, they'll agree on a hell of a lot. Get them kicking the ball in the same direction. And, and how does that compare with what you began with in that switch? Uh, um, we were not as divided, it's fair to say. But um, I think the, there was a desire in Ipswich to improve things from the local authorities' point of view, uh, and also the college being involved was a big factor. I think for of the people who first sat in that room, uh, probably two of them sold out and moved away. Two of them moved to new facilities down down river, deeper water in the port. Um, so people wanted different things, but I think generally speaking, we all we were pushing the same way before we started more. And, and you said a, a couple of times uh, the importance of getting to that 75%. Well, 70, 60%, 80%, 70, 73%. The, the, the point is, is if you can privately act, people have public positions and private positions, and if you can get to people's private positions, I think they will agree on most things. There'll be certain things they won't agree on, period. There'll be some things they won't agree on in public. But, but that, that was our experience with, with Conservative and Labour in the room. Is that, that in private, they all care about Brunswick. In private, they all want Brunswick to improve. So find out what you agree on and deliver that. Because for the people of Brunswick, they want to see delivery. Uh, another plan is great, but they'd rather see delivery. And it can be small stuff. It doesn't have to be earth-changing. You know, in, in the RSVP, one of the things it talks about is putting up string lights. In corporate terms, that's two bits of nothing. But it makes such a difference to perception, because to me, one of the big tricks for, for Brunswick is to change its perception. There are people on St. Simons whose perception of Brunswick isn't great. Like, you know, they might come across the first Friday, and you can't live on one Friday a month. You know, you've got to get people coming across here, visitors, residents, residents from out of town, from out of town. You don't get them coming here every night, or not every night, often, uh, for, for people to survive and thrive. And, and you, you talked in, in your talk, and I think you alluded to, to this um, just now, 
of this notion of the sort of big bomb first versus the yeah. smaller successes. What? Expand on that, sir. Okay, thanks. I mean, oh, and by the way, if you've got questions, start to ask them down. Yeah. Not that I'm running the, out. Basically, <laughs> Eda never put a number to it, but broadly speaking, we were aware that Eda had about 20 million pounds in its pot that it was prepared to put into its switch. Right. We hadn't got the money for it granted, but potentially it was about 20 million. And what we could have done, let's go back on the slides, but in the centre of all that is the, what we call the island site, uh, which was owned by ABP, it had hauliers, timber, uh, it was an uh, asphalt coating plant, it was a mess. And so one of the options for us was to decontaminate it, stabilise the keys, raise the flood walls, um, improve the access to the island site, one big thing in the middle, and hope it's there. The alternative is we put money into flood defences, we put money into Fingal Maltings, we put money into the Arts Centre, we put money into the University. Uh, so there were four or five things that all got about four or five million each. But the effect of each of those, in my opinion, is far greater. Now, when I made the decision not to go, not to push for the one big bomb attack, right, that was probably against my company's best interest because I, I and my company own that island site. But my logic was, at the time when that big bomb might have gone off, land around Waterford was selling for about £200,000 per acre. At its height, we were selling land around, around Waterford for £2 million per acre. Regularly, we were selling it for £1 million an acre. So, in time, the island site will be redeveloped because values will rise sufficient to, to sort things out. But, um, Last year, they finished the flood defences for Ipswich. One of the big deals for Ipswich was that the, the island site was about eight foot below where the high tide comes up to. So they've built, they've built, they've raised the, uh, the flood defences, and now hopefully that makes the island site more economically viable. Do, when you, when you look at, just understanding the, the um, your thoughts on the sort of big bomb versus the small successes idea, when you, when you walk around in, in, um, in what we think of as downtown Brunswick. If you could do one thing, if you could do one thing, and I know you have opinions about this, because you have opinions about everything, uh, but if, if you could do one thing, what would you do? One. You have one. And if you do that really well, then you'll get two. <laughs> give, me a, give me a few. All right. Um, a few. Three. A few, a few. I'd consolidate, I'd consolidate these worthy plants into one comprehensive action plan, and then I'd focus on a relatively small bit of it, and I'll call that Gloucester Bay, Newcastle. Initially, uh, I deliver a waterfront dining. You've got the look from Mary Ross or the marina. You're sitting out, looking west. The only place in the Golden Isles I can go to sit down for a nice meal or a drink. Uh, overlooking the sun as it, su as it sets is the wharf on Jekyll Island. That's madness. Right? So the potential for a, for a proper dining experience down there. But don't rule out the company shed where you sell oysters. This is the, sh the shrimp capital of the world. Right? Right. Go and smell the fish. Go down there and get fresh fish. You know, city Market. Put a shed up down there. Not in, I'm sorry, City Market. Didn't mean to tell you what to do. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but people would go to that because that's different. You can't get that on St. Simon's or Jekyll. It's a different experience. So I would consolidate the plan, focus on one area, bring waterfront dining, and I would get behind this coalition of people that are forming. Because um, it's, it's, it's really exciting to have people pushing together. And with that, you can make things happen. Do, um, you were on this trip to Macon, um, I guess last week, thanks. And um, one of the key features that, that they showed the group from here was the uh, loft apartment yep. development. Yep. How important do you think residential is to I, all of this? I think it's fundamental. Right? Is that you can put the best restaurant in the world in, in front of it, and if nobody walks past the door, it goes down. You've got to have people in restaurants, in shops, going through the door. And the easiest way to do that is to put them downtown. So to me, you talk about lofts. Yeah. Making a got two, three story buildings. Mm -hmm. Brunswick's got less of those. But there's no reason why you can't build them. I mean, to me, um, sorry, Dan and Michael over there, the, the, um, the Torres site, 
you've got a, a, a really nice marina that most people don't go down to, and you've got 20 odd acres of green behind it. A third of that, half of that, could be a mixed use development that links the town with um, where Market and Newcastle and the gallery is down, uh, down to the waterfront. Because it's difficult to develop Mary Ross. I mean, Mary Ross, there's plans for that, but, but maybe you can put something there. Then you've got three or four buildings. You've got a mile and a half of river frontage. Sorry, I'm looking at you, but you've got a mile and a half of river frontage. Go the other way. Georgia Port Authority have got quite a good shed and their office is right next to Mary Ross. Maybe they'll move it, but maybe they won't, because I'm not sure I would. And so you may have to live with that and work around it. Well, we've worked around asphalt coating plants. We can work around a, a shed that stores paper. Beyond that, you've got opportunities by the fishing, where the fishing industry are for a unique place that, that people would go to because it's just different, a bit earthy. Um, that's what I would look for. What was your question? <laughs> I, I think it was sufficiently answered. Okay, here's some questions from the audience. Did you have to deal with the British equivalent of Superfund sites? Uh, yeah. But, um, ports, by their very nature, are contaminated. So uh, I got I mean, every port we had, every bit of land, take it, send it away and get it tested. If you live in urban areas, you'll find arsenic cyanide. If you, if you live in London, you find it. All the ports, to a degree, are contaminated by previous uses: storing coal on the site, shipbuilding, TBTs. So the danger with me is because we were so used to it, uh, it doesn't fade. It, it, it can be decontaminated. Uh, it takes time, it takes money, but it can be dealt with. So we weren't really faced with it. At the front end, I, I worked for AP for 21 years, and probably for the first 10, what we used to do on our land is that we would decontaminate, and then we'd put in the infrastructure, we'd put in the roads, the gas, the water, electrics, and then we'd sell off the sites to office developers or residential developers as it came along. So we actually did decontaminate as we went. Uh, latterly, we didn't do that. We would sell the site more as seen, and all we do. So, and uh, there is, is decontamination paid for by the central government? No, or? no, pollutant plates. Mm. No, I mean, that's the, the, the principle is pollutant plates. Sometimes you have to prove who the polluter was, mm -hmm. and that can be sometimes more difficult than others. But the principle, overriding principle, is pollutant plates. Interesting concept. Um, do this you, is like impact things. That's, yeah, that's a well. breathtaking concept. Um, <laughs> do you think that the zoning in Brunswick in particular, I know you know nothing about zoning, you have no idea. That's a but, Okay. Uh, do you think that the zoning in Brunswick in particular, the placement of the Panova Old Hercules plant, is holding back development of, is holding development of Brunswick back? It's fine if you feel that no, you no, don't uh, know enough, but again, I'd be shocked. I'm talking very much now as an insider. I don't think that Panova, per se, is holding the country back. I think uh, its location, you know, it's, it's very prominent when you come off the island, but um, I'm not sure if it wasn't there that Brunswick would suddenly have flown away. I think there's enough of Brunswick to be getting on with for the next 20 years. I wouldn't worry overly about it. So no, no, I don't think that is particularly holding it back, but I could well be wrong on that. So, this is interesting. Good luck with this one, too. Um, would it help revitalize downtown Brunswick and also enrich the college to incorporate the 18th century school buildings of Glen Academy into college classrooms? This would be similar to what SCAN did in, a, in okay. Savannah and could help revitalize um, again, Brunswick so like SCAN did for Savannah. Well, clearly not my point to tell the college what to do or what not to do. I will only say that the College of Coastal Georgia is very important to Brunswick. And the more it can integrate with Brunswick, whether that be physically or just in operational terms, the better. Uh, personally, I would like to see it physically. Not totally, you've got a big campus here, you've got plenty of land, and, uh, but to me, there are, if, if the kids are in Brunswick Town Centre, there's a great value to Brunswick City Centre, sorry. There's a great value to that. Uh, I think there's a value to you because you're selling you're selling uh, a, an experience of coming to coastal Georgia that is coastal. Uh, what you're selling now, it's near the coast, but it's not on the coast. And I'm sure uh, the kids would love a more vibrant rather than being out here in dorms. 
compared to ten, ten times up. So whether it's those buildings or whether it's a new facility or whatever, I would ask you to look at it. Uh, your value to the tech, to the city is great, and your your impact, the impact in Ipswich, was immense, because suddenly coffee shops that couldn't exist were were opening, cafes because the kids that's where the kids went to. Uh, kids kids give life to a place. Like, they'll do things that you wouldn't dream of doing. Yeah. Um, how, how big is the university there? Five thousand. Yeah, so it's not. So it's, it's not. It's not much different. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sorry. I know just before. And its background was in um, in uh, health and medicine. So it was very, very, very similar. They moved. They broadened it now, but it started off principally with healthcare. So the um, this is a, this is actually. Uh, okay. This is a good question that that poses that sort of um, suggests a bigger question. Brunswick Port has not been privatized. Should that matter? No. And also the relationship no. between. Sorry, no. I, I again answer it slightly different. The question yeah. is, you know, might be the same. Sort of. um, I think I think involving the port, Georgia Port Authority, Port of Brunswick, in discussions about the city of Brunswick are really important. Um, but it's one of the parties that actually hasn't yet. Come with this coalition that uh, the, the foundations form, but whether they play an active role in it, or whether they, whether they play a passive role, with the, are your neighbours? They're really important to it. They, they, they're a big employer. They have an impact. You know, they, they are really important. So you've got to engage with them. The, um, even if you argue with them, it's important you engage with them. The benefit we had in Ipswich, and we did have arguments, is that uh, we had arguments in the room. It's far better to have an argument in the room than have an argument through the paper, uh, newspaper. And so to me, you, you get all the parties involved, you, you engage with them, you take it if you don't agree with you, you deal with it, but you actually find there is common ground. And, and you know, to me, you have to engage with them. It's too important not to engage with them. Just, again, just as an aside, because it's now taken me there, um, ABP at one point owned a company called American Port Services and Ports. And Amports actually it used to be, don't they? now were the car handling company that dealt with um, the cars on Brunswick in Brunswick. So I actually was aware of Brunswick even before the. Um, a, a, a question that um, in thinking about all of this in Brunswick and Ipswich that, that comes to mind is that it's a very different scale. Yeah. I mean, Ipswich is yeah. how big? Well, in terms of scale of people. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, Ipswich population is 130,000, but like here, uh, what the visitor would think of as being Ipswich actually isn't Ipswich because the area around it is considered to be Ipswich, but actually is in other counties in Suffolk. Uh, same as here, you've got the city of Brunswick, but if you go to TJ Maxx or Lowe's, you're actually in the county, it's outside of the city. And so in Ipswich, we consider that to be the functional, the, the, the whole thing that the visitor would see as being the functional urban core. So the, the um, population of Ipswich was 130,000, the functional urban core of Ipswich was 165,000. For, for comparison, I apologise if I get slightly wrong, but 15, 16,000 for the city of Brunswick, 50 odd thousand for, um, for, the, for the greater Brunswick. Uh, so the scale is different, uh, and that will you know, possibly give different solutions. Certainly I wouldn't be recommending any 20 storey tower box for example. Uh, but each place is different. The, the, the lesson of this is not what can I look at that's in Ipswich and have one of those places. It's you go to Macon, you go to Columbia, you go to Ipswich, you go to places and you take it and then you, you, and then you don't take it and, and follow it. You, you take it and use it to inform what you want to achieve in your community. Br Brunswick's solution has got to be for Brunswick. Not mine, not Ipswich's, not Macon's. But, but, but you can look at others and, and take things from them. Use them. There's very, new, there's very few new ideas in the world. You take an old one and you twist it. You change it to suit your purpose. So someone is interested in the incubator and also yep. in putting you on the spot. So okay. um, let's start with the incubator questions. Who, oper who operates the incubator and yep. what is offered there other than space? Okay, uh, I can do it in reverse. Um, what is offered other than space is basically uh, a receptionist, uh, a meeting, series of meeting rooms, and a communal, not cafe area, but you know, somewhere you can get refreshments. 
Uh, after that, it is um, either open plan floor space or it's take, uh, modular offices within that open floor, floor space. Who operates it? Uh, the IP City Centre is operated by the city, and the one in Freela Maltings was operated by the landlord of the, of the block. So I don't think there's a right and wrong on that. It, I mean, they, they take a revenue stream. Uh, the revenue stream is relatively insecure because it's startups. It's relatively insecure because it's short tenure. But these are the people who don't know whether they're going to die or succeed, expand, contract. So you have to give them somewhere they can, they can go. But if you, have, if you give them that, they have a decent address. Instead they're working from their back bedroom or their kitchen table, they have an address. They can get investors down to meet in proper facilities. You know, you'd be amazed how they do grow. And, and you can do it. Incubators, we use largely office incubators, but you can do it for other things. You know, if you start small, give them a chance and they'll grow. Macon, how many times did we hear about entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who had silly ideas who actually came off? Into I actually said crazy ideas. Crazy ideas. Yeah. Um, oh, so, what, is that the full question? No. Now, uh, I'm slowly leading you to the payout question. Um, this is sort of like pitching, which is part of an American sport. Yeah. Um, what public transportation options are available in Ipswich? Absolutely right. And so when I said about what would I, what I, what I, what I do in Brunswick, and I mentioned about consolidating a plan, and I mentioned about getting a restaurant where I can sit and drink my drink and eat my food looking out of sunset, uh, the one big thing that I forgot, and I shouldn't have forgot, is public transportation. In Britain, we're blessed with a wonderful transportation system. That, uh, you know, we complain about it all the time, but when you, when, you, when you come over here and you haven't got it, my God, you have, you're grateful for it. So we have a bus system that uh, you know, runs all the time, everywhere. We have a train system that takes you in and out a lot. You know, it stops, stops 20 times and you get annoyed by how long it takes to get anywhere, but it actually does get you there. Through. So we've got a really good transportation system, and that does help, and we take it for granted. Um, yeah, we take it for granted. Uh, so me, uh, you need to sort out stuff. You need, you need some form of getting people who can't or like get into town centre, into town centre, whether it be students or whether it be residents. So for example, uh, my son went to university in Brighton, and Brighton is on the coast, it's uh, all fun and funky lights down here. Uh, they've got one building down in central Brighton, they've got another one about a mile out, they've got two about a mile and a half out, they've got another one about two miles out, and they've got halls of residence about three miles out. And they run a bus up, and it's a one road, basically they're all on. And they run a, a shuttle back and two, back and two, back and two, 15, 20 seater bus called the Yellow Lemon. And the Yellow Lemon runs all day, all time, all night. So it gets you in for a seven o'clock lecture, it gets you out of the nightclub at three o'clock in the morning. But, but it runs all the time, it just goes back and two, back and two, and you know that if you stand there long enough, the yellow lemon will come past. That's not the solution to you, for you here. But uh, by moving students in and out, you'll get some money from them. You need people who work in shops, you need people who work in restaurants. So some of the people in Brunswick would do those jobs if they could get in and out. So I would look at MLK and try and get something happening up and down MLK, and if you can get it broader than that, and if you can do a figure of eight, absolutely wonderful. But, but to me, getting people in and out of Brunswick on the MLK, um, to me, really important. Okay, now, why do you think the Brunswick community is so divided? I don't want to say that. Oh, sorry, you've got, you've got some... You have racial issues that we don't have. There's a first one. I don't think that's the reason why you're divided, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a factor you, you've got to acknowledge. And um, we have poverty, but we don't have the racial part here. And um, it, it appears to me that you have some good people who, who, who are with the Commission, and good people who are with the city, who aren't seeing eye to eye. But I swear they all want the best for, the, for their people, they, they want the best for their city. And I want, I want them to talk to each other and work out what they can agree on, rather than arguing about what they can't agree on. Because I'm sure there'll be things they can agree on. Do things, do things that are not confrontational, achieve them, and actually be surprised how you, what, what you agree on changes. I said 75%. The truth is, after a few years, it was about 85% we all agreed on. Because over time, your views, cha your views change, they moderate. And if you can start achieving some early wins on things that are non-confrontational, that you do agree on, then, then trust and, and 
partnership will come through. So in your experience in the past couple of weeks, That's are a you... horrible question. That is my favorite question. So um, I'd like to come, sorry, I'd like, I'm coming back in September. I'd like to get, get back into it. Uh, um, now you made me lose my train of thought. Oh, so in the, past, in the past few weeks where you've been in this almost crash course of, of finding out what, what's, what's going on here, do you see the makings of that 75%? Yeah. So, absolutely, absolutely. So what are, what are some key points of agreement that you see, felt some kind of consensus around that you think you begin, you can begin to see that? Okay. Um, I think there is a desire to make things happen. I think there is a desire to identify priorities <coughs> and endeavor to remove obstacles. Uh, I think there is um, passion. I think there's a, a, desire, uh, yeah, a passion for change, for improvement. Um, and that's it. Not really. Okay. No, yeah, just ask me a question again. Well, I mean, this is my question. So, it was, um, so I, I, was, I can't remember it on a card, but it was um, no. Are you seeing the making of that twenty-five percent, seventy-five percent? Absolutely. And what pieces of that seventy-five percent are you beginning that you think you can see patient? I think it's by fairly, fairly quick agreement to put in more trees in Brunswick's uh, downtown area. I think it's find agreement to put in the lights in Brunswick's downtown area. I think it's probably find agreement to doing improvements to Mary Ross and down and, and, and improving or downgrading the the of the obstacle at Bay Street. Um, I think those things to me would be not very confrontational, not very costly. I mean, they're cost, but not not silly ones. And that's before you start getting to bigger projects. I think there's a fair bit of agreement. Um, what's your view on the convention center? I'm not answering the question. <laughs> I said I'd do drop the mic at a certain point, that's the point. <laughs> are, are you saying you don't have an opinion? I have an opinion, which is my opinion. <laughs> um, we're not done here yet. He's not getting off this stage that easily. Um, we, we, better, uh, we better sell before how we, we do it. get too Can I ask one more? Sure, one more okay. question. So um, one of, the, one of the, the, the themes of your presentation and also of your many discussions with many of us is this notion of, of bringing the whole community into the discussion. Yeah. Um, talk about that and talk about it in terms of how important you think, of the things that we have to do to be successful, where do you place that line? I think asking the community, listening to what they say, might be education. You, you, I, might learn things, be surprised about things. What concerns and things the population want? And you've got so many different populations. The danger is that when you say that, you're talking about our right? We can just as easily be talking about Free Square. You know, it, it's, it, there's, there's different people in it that all constitute Brunswick. And you've got to get all those views in. But then when you've got all those views in and you've listened to what they say, you're, you're my priorities may actually be in there, but not the top thing. And so I think it's really important to ask the question. Because if those people believe you listen, then they'll support you. And if they believe that yet again you're planning for them, not with them, then why would they support you? Why would, why would they get behind you and possibly encourage their elected members to, to support what you're trying to achieve? They have a lot of power if you can harness them. But you've got to, you've got to ask them and listen. One more quick commercial message, speaking of planning. Um, before First Friday, tomorrow night, there's going to be a, a session on the RSVP, RSVP plan, which is the strategic plan uh, as it stands now with Brunswick. It will be at 1908 Newcastle, which I think is the old Ford building. Is that right? Good, thank you for the nodding. 1908. 1608. Well, unfortunately, the official invitation. I thought it was 1608. Uh, okay. Well, then it's it's somewhere between 1608 and 1908. <laughs> uh, next, next door to the wick. Between five and seven, come. Um, there's a lot of interest in hearing your thoughts, and there will be refreshments and great entertainment that we can all go play in the street. <laughs> go on.
so on behalf of uh, the college and certainly our committee and subcommittee, uh, we want to thank you for a very enlightening uh, presentation and discussion. Thank you so much for being here, both of you gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Martin, for, uh, for all the effort you clearly put into this. And thank you, Bert, for bringing Martin and his lovely wife, Janet, here to our area. I think you probably had a, a big influence in that. So well, since you mentioned Janet, this is my lovely wife, Melinda. And, and your <laughs> lovely wife, Melinda. So thank you all for, uh, for being here tonight. Okay, so. So I will say, I, I did have very high expectations because I've, I've had the chance to, to get to know Martin a bit, but uh, honestly, he did exceed the expectations. And I think that we, we had a chance to see some of the images, and even though we all have grand ideas for what Brunswick can be already, I think uh, all of us probably came away with a few more that, uh, that we're thinking about right now. So thank you for that. Uh, and, and I just want to say, I, I mean, humbly, I'm very proud that we've been able to attract two outstanding speakers for our first two events, uh, both Ryan Gravel, who, uh, for those of you who weren't able to make it, uh, was, uh, was, was just amazing and gave us uh, the, the thought of what a powerful idea can do, one powerful idea can do. And then I think what, what Martin's brought is a whole new perspective specifically about a port city that isn't altogether that different from uh, the one that we're we love here and that we live uh, where, where we live or live next to. Um, so what I would say is there was no charge for tonight, uh, but we, we do have a few things that, uh, uh, well, at least a couple of things that we'd like to ask you to consider. First of all, uh, as Martin pointed out, it's, it's important to uh, participate in First Friday in the, in the events, the RSVP event this this Friday which is tomorrow so we would ask that you please attend if you're not planning to and get others there are so many others that I know you all know please ask them to attend first Friday but beyond that as Martin said make it a point if you don't work and already spend a lot of time in downtown Brunswick get down there during the week in the evening and spend time there the second thing that I would ask is that you talk about Brunswick in a very positive light. I mean, I think that all of us recognize that there are opportunities for improvement, but it really is an amazing place. And I, I think back to what Ryan Gravel said to me when he when he walked in Brunswick the first time. And he said, "My goodness, I've heard so many things, and I had kind of a I was kind of afraid to to see what it was like. And and, and actually, it's quite wonderful. Well, guess what? It is wonderful. My goodness, I, I work down there just about every every day now that I'm in in the area." And it is a wonderful place, so get down there and enjoy it, and, and make sure that you know you talk about the things that are happening now, and the fact that there is positive momentum building. There are people that are moving to our area now, and they are living, they're moving to downtown Brunswick, uh, when they could easily move elsewhere if they wanted to, and that's a great sign, and I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and then I guess the third thing I would say is stay tuned, uh, for our next event, the third and final of the year, it'll be in the autumn, as you would say, Martin. In American, that's fall. Uh, we have not yet scheduled that, but we will be. <laughs> and we also promise not to disappoint. So in closing, uh, thank you so much for being here. There will be rides for anyone that needs uh, a ride to the parking lot. Uh, we'll have uh, shuttles available, and uh, really, truly, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate all of you being here and participating, and thank you for a wonderful time. And one other thing, Mark has agreed to stick around and be peppered with questions. So, in fact, I think he would like to be peppered with questions. So.